Hello everyone and thanks for watching. This is Professor Ryan Paul and you are watching my video presentation on the poem To a Daughter Leaving Home by Linda Paston. So one of the things that I want to stress in every time you read a poem is to think about the poem not as a collection of symbols or arcane difficult riddles that you have to unlock. Instead, think about a poem as a bit of conversation, as something that someone is speaking, saying to another person. This will help you make the poem come alive as a real utterance, as a real uh, expression of a voice, of a person, a personality, rather than thinking about it as some intellectual puzzle that you have to solve. Let's make this concrete with an example, and I think To a Daughter Leaving Home is an exa excellent example uh, uh, for why this principle is important. The title tells us a lot about the poem. It tells us what's going on, the situation. Someone is writing to a daughter leaving home. And when does a daughter leave home? Or when does a child leave home? Well, children leave home every day on their way to school. But we might think this is a more significant leaving home, if it's a significant enough to write a poem about it or to record what happened in poetic form. It's significant enough that this is not just an everyday leaving home to go to the school or to go to the store or to go out on a date. So when do children leave home? When did you leave home? When you went to college or if you got married or went to live with a partner or you went to live your independent life because you got a job. It's a rite of passage. It's something that happens at a major change in someone's life when they're going from being child to adult in one sense. And so if this is written to a daughter leaving home, who's writing it or who's saying it? One of the parents. And we might assume because the author is a woman that the parent is the mother. I don't think that's necessarily true one way or the other. I think this could be the father or the mother, but let's just say it's the mother. Why not? What might someone feel at this moment? when their daughter leaves home? What are the sort of emotions that they would have towards them about this event? Certainly there's a sense of pride that your child is leaving. In, we might think, this isn't necessary in all situations, of course, but a parent might feel pride. This is their child going off, making the next step in their life. Of course, there's also a feeling of sadness because the child is leaving little creature being, human being that you've raised from youth into adulthood is not going to be there anymore, part of your life for the last 18, 20 plus years, however long. So there's that sadness, perhaps some fear, anxiety. You're not going to be there to watch over your child anymore. So what's going to happen to them? Are they going to make the right decisions? What are you going to be able to do if your child is away and your child does something wrong? You won't be able to have as much impact. You won't be able to help and protect the way you could. Of course, some parents might be glad their children are leaving. It might be a rocky relationship. The parents and the children might not get along. The parents might be abusive. The child might have all sorts of problems, criminal drug problems. So this might be a joyous occasion, or at least uh, a relief for the parent. Or it might be an angry occasion, a bitter parting. A child who feels that their parents are oppressive. So these are all possibilities. And there are, of course, many, many more possibilities. But what's important is to understand that this is a, a parting, a farewell. That's a very particular situation. That's a particular genre, we might say, of speaking, of communication. So what do you do at a major farewell when you're saying goodbye to someone for maybe a long time? What do you use that as an opportunity to do? What might you want to say to them at that moment that you couldn't say before? What might you not be able to say to them at that moment? What might you want to say but not be able to? These are all things that we keep in mind when we understand or that we bring to mind when we realize, ah, what I'm reading here is a farewell, is someone saying goodbye. So understanding how they speak. Who is this person saying goodbye? What are they trying to say? And how are they saying it? Let me read the poem. Follow along. When I taught you 
at eight to ride a bicycle loping along beside you as you wobbled away on two round wheels, my own mouth rounding in surprise when you pulled ahead down the curved path of the park. I kept waiting for the thud of your crash as I sprinted to catch up while you grew smaller, more breakable with distance, pumping, pumping for your life, screaming with laughter, the hair flapping behind you like a handkerchief waving goodbye. So what is literally happening in this poem? What is the mother literally talking about? Well, she's telling her daughter who's leaving home now about something that happened in the past. When I taught you at eight, when you were eight years old, and I taught you to ride. So she's, so she's reminiscing about a past event. Why might she do that? Why might she do that while speaking to her daughter? What effect does she want to have on her daughter? What is she trying to make her daughter feel or think Perhaps create a sense of nostalgia. Remember what happened back then? Remember that fond memory? Maybe trying to connect to her daughter over something that they shared in the past, given that her daughter is now about to leave. Perhaps it's a reminder of all the things that she's done for her daughter. Don't forget me after you've gone. What is, she, what is the nature of the memory? Her mother is teaching the daughter to ride a bicycle. Well, what is riding a bicycle? What is she doing by teaching her daughter to ride a bicycle? She's giving her a mode of transportation. A bicycle is something that you use to get from one place to another. So the mother is literally teaching the daughter how to leave home, teaching her how to ride a bicycle, to ride down the street. So what happens? The daughter wobbles away. And think about that verb, wobble. What does wobbling look like? And what might a mother think or feel seeing her daughter wobble away? Or any parent think seeing their child wobble away on a bicycle? And the, the daughter pulls ahead down the curve, pulling ahead away from the mother. So the mother has taught the daughter how to ride the bike and the daughter is riding the bike away. And what's the mother's reaction? Her mouth rounds in surprise. Oh my gosh, I can't believe you're, you're doing it. Surprise why? Surprise that the daughter is able to? Surprise that the daughter actually goes? So the daughter is riding the bike away. And how does it make the mother feel? She now recalls what did she feel back then as she saw her daughter ride away? I kept waiting for the thud of your crash. What is she expecting? I was expecting you to fall. I was expecting you to fail, to hurt yourself. And this is the anxiety of the mother, of the parent, worrying about their child, anything new they do, hoping that the child won't hurt themselves, wanting to protect them, expecting the worst because of that anxiety that parents have. But the daughter doesn't crash. The daughter keeps going. The daughter still pulls away, again surprising the mother. I was surprised that you were, that you didn't fall, that you stayed up on your two wheels, that your wobbling didn't tumble over. And what happens? She grows smaller. And notice how the poet has broken that phrase up. While you grew, in the next line, smaller. What does this mean to grow smaller? Well, she's literally talking about how her daughter appears as she gets further and further away, right? As something moves away from you, it appears to be getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And that's the literal perspective. And that also captures the emotional perspective that the mother feels. As the daughter is learning to ride her bicycle, learning a new skill, literally learning the skill of transportation, and she moves away, and it's making her farther and farther away from the, dog, from the mother. But at the same time, it's growth. She's growing that paradox, that oxymoron of growing smaller. The words technically contradict each other, but they make a neat kind of sense, because as the child grows, grows older, grows bigger, grows up, 
they become more distant from their parent. You become a separate person. You do your own things. You start going on your own path, pulling away from them. So as you grow bigger, in some sense, you're going smaller by becoming more and more distant from your parents. And that's what they see. That's what this mother is remembering, seeing in her daughter riding the bike away. And how does she look to the mother? What is, how does the mother interpret this growth towards smallness? Well, she's more breakable. The, the mother, the less the mother is able to help, help, the more the mother worries about the child. The less she's able to protect, the more she thinks if something happens to her, she'll be damaged. So the paradox she's capturing here, the paradox of the growth, the paradox of all of us growing older, in that we grow older, but that makes us more distant from our parents. That as the parents watch us grow up, they also see us grow away, grow smaller, grow more distant, literally, on the horizon. So the physical distance in the memory expresses the emotional distance of the present moment, when her daughter's about to go off to college or go off to live with her partner or go off to live on her own with a new job and career, wherever the daughter might be going. The physical distance and the emotional distance are one. And we see the mother's anxiety growing even further as the daughter moves away. Pumping, pumping for your life, screaming with laughter. We have here the mother's anxiety and fear juxtaposed or compared to placed alongside the child's exhilaration. Because the child is pumping for her life. And normally when we say that phrase, doing something for your life, we mean you have, you're doing it because if you don't do it, you'll die. That's what pumping for your life means. So the, the mother is watching the daughter learn this new skill, watching her live her life, and seeing it as, in some sense, what it is, a life or death struggle. That this is everything the daughter learns as a child, that's going to be part of what makes her a, a, an adult. That's going to be part of what forms her adult life. And she sees her daughter screaming but her daughter's screaming with laughter. So the child is exhilarated because the child's growing up. The child is experiencing something new. The daughter is doing something that she's never done before. And she has a feeling of perhaps freedom. We only get the mother's perspective, but we can perhaps imagine the daughter's perspective. The freedom of being able to ride the bike, to be able to go on one's own. That exhilaration of the first time being independent from the parent which is also scary for the child. It's scary and exhilarating at the same time. The poem ends with a striking image, a comparison or simile in technical terms. The hair flapping behind you like a handkerchief waving goodbye. So the mother sees her daughter's hair flapping behind her and she compares it to a handkerchief waving goodbye. Let's think about the logic behind that comparison. How is the handkerchief like the hair? Or how is the hair like the handkerchief? Well, there's the, we can imagine the physical movement of a handkerchief that is flapping up and down and a child's long hair perhaps making the same wavy motion. So we have that physical similarity. And the idea of waving goodbye and the child is departing. So as the child moves away, the hair flapping, it reminds the mother of a handkerchief flapping goodbye as it departs, as it recedes away. So another physical similarity, but also it, it about the, the, what, the physical me, what the physical gesture means. And why do we use handkerchiefs? What is a handkerchief for? We use handkerchiefs to blot our eyes, to, to, to dry our tears, to blow our noses when we're crying, when we're sad. And we might be sad at a departure, right? That's why the handkerchief is out, because you wave goodbye with it and then you dry your tears with it. So the handkerchief also says without saying the mother's sorrow. It expresses that she's sad that her daughter is leaving without saying I'm crying. And 
we also might think that when do you see someone waving a handkerchief goodbye? It's not a typical image. It's not something that you see in the modern world that often. Or even when this, because this poem was published in 1988, not very long ago. So in the 1980s, you didn't see people waving goodbye with handkerchiefs very much. It's a sort of romanticized image. We might think about old movies where people are on boats waving goodbye, or maybe on trains waving goodbye. And that reference back, that call back to this past, this romanticized past, but also past when distances were much greater than they are now. In 100 years ago, 200 years ago, if someone was traveling by boat to go to the other side of the world, you may never see that person again. Distances were much further. Distances now are so much closer because of communications, because of technology, transportation technology is so advanced. But in the olden days, so to speak, it's someone leaving on a long trip. That was uh, perhaps your final goodbye. So there's a certain romanticization of this goodbye. And it almost threatens to make this you know, simple memory of a child learning to ride the bike compared to, you know, someone leaving on a boat to go to the new world or a soldier perhaps departing and leaving his loved one on the docks, going off to war, perhaps to never come home, bringing these two moments together, bringing these two images together, a mother teaching her daughter to ride the bike and this, again, grand goodbye. And they're brought together at this moment when the daughter is leaving home. The daughter is going off to her adult life, whatever that may be. So what does this tell us about the mother and her experience at this moment? What might she be feeling? Again, go back to our original list of emotions, right? We see the pride. We see the fear and anxiety. And we see this, you know, almost sort of comical comparison, perhaps, of of uh, the childhood memory with the romanticized goodbye. And there are other meanings circulating in this poem. We might see the mother as being a little, uh, maybe perhaps self-aware that she was being overprotective then and overprotective now. Perhaps some irony in this comparison. Or maybe this mother is a little obsessive. Maybe this mother doesn't even realize how obsessive she is about her daughter and the fears she has about her daughter. Because she doesn't come out and say, I'm afraid now that you're leaving. So there's a lot more we can talk about in this poem. We could talk about, for example, the particular verbs that are used and why the mother uses these actions and how that further characterizes her or gives us options for understanding the um, ideas she's communicating, the emotions she's feeling, the relationship, the reality of this situation between her and her daughter. We could look further at the lineation, that is the way the lines are structured and the sentences are broken up into lines. Because by doing, uh, by certain moves, for example, the one you pointed out, while you grew smaller, by inserting that break in that phrase, grew smaller, it highlights the oxymoron of the words and through them, the paradox of the mother and daughter relationship or the parent-child relationship, that the parent, that as the child grows older, they become more distant from the parent and thus smaller in a visual, physical sense. So what I've done is lead you through a reading of the poem as a dramatic situation, as a real situation where one person is speaking to another. And to go back to the principle that we talked about at the beginning, thinking about it as, again, a real situation rather than a load of symbols to be identified and decoded makes it come alive. We can see it as something really happening. We can see it as an act of communication rather than just a puzzle. So what is the real situation that is going on? A farewell. And we use that idea of what happens at a farewell between a parent and child. What might be the context? What might be the purpose of saying farewell? What do you want to get across in a farewell? And we could go further and say there's another genre within this. That is the anecdote or recounting a memory, recalling a memory. So the person is saying goodbye and they say goodbye by, in, in, through recounting a memory. 
And so what is the nature of this memory? How does it overlap with or how does it comment on the situation of the farewell? Why does this mother or parent use this particular memory to talk to her daughter at this particular moment? What does it tell us about their relationship? And thinking in those terms, thinking about the situation and how does this situation, what is the real situation going on in this fictional drama? What's the world that the poem creates? That makes it, again, uh, makes it much easier to read and understand and then gives us a footing for further interpretation, further analysis uh, of more, uh, to then start going into things like the particularity of imagery, symbols, poetic devices, all that sort of stuff. So keep this in mind as you read other poems. Who's talking? Who are they talking to? And why are they talking? What's the situation? And if they're saying goodbye, what does that mean? If it's a love letter, what do you say in a love letter? What do you say in an apology? What do you say in a complaint? And these poems all take those genres and then they do something a little bit different with them. They twist it. They break our expectations and show us something new about the very situation they're talking about. In this farewell, we see more than just a mother's sadness, but we see very carefully how, and very beautifully, how memory, past and present are interwoven, how pride and fear are interwoven, how a mother's love can also perhaps in some sense be stifling, the desire to care, the desire to protect can go too far. So we see all these different, even somewhat contradictory ideas being brought to life in the reality of the poem and the reality that they communicate to us about that relationship. So the poem gives us a new perspective on our own reality by breaking the convention, by taking what might happen in real life and by looking carefully at what happens in real life and taking that real situation and breaking the convention shows us something new about the parent-child relationship, about the act of saying goodbye, about the act, about the nature of memory. All right. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions, feel free to email, comment. My students, you know how to get in touch with me. I hope you enjoyed it. And I will see you in the next video. I wish you the day you wish yourselves. Take care.